Community Access Cable provides opportunities. It gives you the chance for participation, not just from the local residents, but educational institutes, nonprofits, and government agencies. My name is Deborah Rogers. I'm the chair of the board of directors of the Alliance for Community Media and the foundation of the Alliance for Community Media. Yes, we are two organizations now. It's been 25 years since we were together in Chicago, and I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to see all of you. We have a wonderful program uh, this morning and the rest of today and tomorrow, and so I'm not going to take any more of your time other than to just say welcome, and I hope you will introduce yourselves to me if you have not met me, and, and if you know me and you haven't said hi yet, please come and do that as well. So at this point, I'd like to bring up Jay Robertson, who is chair of the Western Region of the Alliance for Community Media to do our Pahu or drum ceremony. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And uh, thank you very much, Richard, a most profound and expert blowing of the conch shell. You don't want me doing that, trust me. Back in 1994, the Alliance for Community Media held a conference in Honolulu, Hawaii. And at that time, in keeping with the Hawaiian custom, and as a sign of deep respect for this alliance and the conference participants, the local conference planning committee, comprised of Olelo Community Television in Honolulu, presented a ho'okupu, which is a very significant tribute and offering to uh, the group. The ho'okupu is this pahu that you see uh, on the stage in front of me. It is a Hawaiian drum. This is one of the most important and significant musical instruments in our culture and in the tradition of Hawaiian dance known as the hula kahiko. This pahu was given the name of kia i i kaleo, which means to protect the voice. The hula pahu held great and very profound significance within the culture. And its name, to protect the voice, was given to it to symbolize this alliance and its fundamental mission to ensure that all of the voices of all of our communities are heard. This pahu was offered to the alliance to represent that mission in all of our community access organizations that support and give voice to our communities. And it also symbolizes the alliance's role to guide, to nurture, as well as to enlighten and to empower our communities through the use of this media. Through each of the past 18 years, a bit of the spirit, the energy from all of the previous conferences has been transferred into Kia i Kaleo. And that spirit is shared with each organization in order to bring strength and focus to our national efforts. Hawaii's local planning committee expected that at some time in the future, the Kia i Kaleo would return home, either for the next conference to be held in our islands that might be hosted by us, or if at any time that the Alliance feels that they could no longer maintain the integrity of this tradition. Each year at the opening of this Alliance conference, Kia i Kaleo is presented to the conference participants in recognition of the history and the symbolism. And at the end of each conference, Kia i Kaleo is going to be given to the next year's host, and that will then transfer some of the energy that you all put into this, Pahu, into the next access organization effort. So this thing has collected spirits for the past 18 years and brings a collective energy to our conference today. One thing in particular with this pahu, it is made from breadfruit, which was a very sacred tree. It was designed and developed and, and put together by a kupuna, uh, an ancient one who really is a master of the craft. The drum skin is made of shark skin and it is tied together with the senate created from a coconut tree through its winding. This pahu brings all of that energy and all of the tradition and the cultural significance of each of our communities, not just Hawaii, but everywhere it has been throughout our nation. And today, we are glad to have it to open this conference and to bring that same energy, spirit, and enlightenment. So I ask that each of you make your contribution in your efforts through this conference to add to this pahu, this tradition, as we move forward. Thank you and aloha. Good morning, and thank you, Jay. 
Well, we hope you enjoyed yesterday's exhibit hall and conference activities and our reception last night. We have a full day of workshops today and our hometown media awards gala this evening. Please join me in thanking our sponsors, Tightrope Media Systems, Telview, Classic Art Showcase, Your Sanctuary, Castus, New Tech, and Comcast Project Open Voice. Without them, this conference would not have been possible. Our sponsors are all wearing special ribbons denoting their participation, so please take a moment to thank them. I'd also, um, if they're in the room, just like to give a special thanks to my team from the ACM. Cartrice, Hector, Tricia have our events team, and Greg Morrison, who just ran out to, uh, to do some more work, is our manager of membership. So if you have a chance to grab them, say thank you. They have staff on their badges. It's now my privilege to introduce CAN TV's executive director, Barbara Popovic, from this year's host city. Barbara has just really gone beyond the call of duty in, in helping us get this conference organized. So please welcome her to the stage. Thank you, Sylvia. Imagine my surprise when I picked this up and saw that I'm the conference chair. <laughs> I was like, okay, I better check with Sylvia and see what I have to do here. <laughs> um, let's be real. Uh, the tremendous amount of work that went into this conference, I think we should really give a round of applause to Sylvia Strobel for what she's done to bring us together here. And I'm really pleased to tell you that CAN TV is here. Uh, we're recording this, so it will be available. We are also live streaming. We've been working with Live View. Uh, if you have folks at home who might want to tune in, if you're not West Coast and they're still in bed, um, then it's cantv.org backslash live. They can check it out. We hope it works well. We've been testing this and plan to be using it throughout the city. So we're really pleased to be here today and at the closing plenary doing the same. And I really want to welcome you to Chicago. Um, I hope while you're here you pick up a book by one of our authors that capture the spirit of our city. Nelson Algren, Studs Terkel, Mike Royko, Alex Kotlowitz, they all reach beyond the lakefront and go into the neighborhoods. Algren called Chicago a lovely so real. Kotlowitz titled his Chicago stories, Never a City So Real. Working at CAN TV, I can relate to that, and I think you probably can too. On local public access channels, there's no Oz behind the curtains, no spin doctor in the wings, just real people interacting with their community. And whether it's arts initiatives, jobs, health care, community news, or public safety information, PEG channels exist to extend that speech. When authorities stand firm for the founding principles of localism and diversity embodied in the Federal Cable Act, PEG channels thrive. It's my privilege today to introduce Rosemary Krimble, Commissioner of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection under Mayor Rahm Emanuel. An accomplished lawyer, businesswoman, and longtime public servant, Rosemary didn't hesitate when approaching cable franchise renewals that began this past year in Chicago. She immediately saw that the city and CAN TV needed to be partners with a common purpose of providing service to the public. As a result, Chicago put the public first in the RCN franchise, setting the standard for a decade to come. We need more like that around the country, and I hope you'll join me in giving a very warm welcome to Commissioner Rosemary Kremble. Thank you, Barbara. That was a lovely introduction. Thank you. And welcome to Chicago, uh, a great city. I hope you'll enjoy it while you're here. It is my pleasure to be here, um, to be speaking before a group that's committed 
to fair media access and local programming. I happen to be, and Barbara doesn't know this, so I've talked about it a little bit, a bit of a local cable access junkie. I have a few programs that I like. One I used to be addicted to on Thursday nights <laughs> here on, um, it was on CAN TV. Uh, so I come to my position in regulating the city of Chicago's cable franchising with a very positive attitude towards local access. I think it is something that every community needs, and I think that the municipalities should be strong in supporting it. <laughs> Community access cable provides opportunities. It gives you the chance for participation, not just from the local residents, but educational institutes, nonprofits, and government agencies. As some of you may or may not know, the city of Chicago also has uh, a public access channel, Channel 49 here in Chicago. And we have a new producer now working on that, and she has done some amazing things, and we're changing access, and we're changing information, and getting it to the public and to the communities. And I feel we have a very strong partnership now with CAN TV in doing that. Local access channels, they provide an open forum. They provide a place where people can exercise their First Amendment rights, where people can do what they want to do, create and be creative, and people can watch it, and people who have talent can be out there, and they can bubble up and be seen. Only local access allows that. CAN TV and the City of Chicago have a new partnership, and because of that partnership, we've been able here in the city to diversify the content in our local access and to allow participation by more and more residents and more of the community and be able to protect that access. Local programming here, and I'm sure throughout the country, provides an incubator an incubator for, it just has no limits. There's cultural things, there are educational, there's community meetings, there's information that can get out there that in many, many ways is the only source for that information. There are people, un not unlike me, who watch local cable because it is their source of information for local events, for government events, for educational events. And this is what local access should be in addition to being an incubator for talent. It is a very positive and open venue for getting programming and information out to the communities and the public. Now there are challenges. I certainly, when I came to this position a little more than a year ago, uh, realized these challenges. Um, but uh, fortunately for me, I had a strong partner in CAN TV who was there. And uh, it was my belief that working together with CAN TV here in the city of Chicago, that we would be able to assure the future of local access programming here in the city. This year, the partnership between the city and CAN TV resulted in a brand new franchise agreement with RCN. It was a, a tough, tough road. Uh, we had a lot of bumps, uh, some valleys and some hills. Um, but we successfully negotiated a new contract franchise agreement for 10 years to provide and secure the future of local access programming here in Chicago. <laughs> now the new franchise agreement here provides 1% of PEG funding and it's tied to the company's revenues. So it grows as the cable company grows. It also provides HD transmission for all of our local access cables uh, channels. It also provides 30 hours of video on demand per week. And it provides for equivalent signal quality and functionality of all of our PEG channels here in Chicago. So I feel strong about CAN TV. 
I feel strong about the city of Chicago local access cable channel, and I feel strong about the future of local access, and I hope it stays strong, and I hope that the rest of the country will be able to follow what I hope will be our lead. And I thank Barbara for her participation, and I thank all of you for asking me to come today. Thank you so much, and welcome. That would have been dramatic, <laughs> unplanned. Uh, thank you so much, Commissioner Kremble. Isn't that great? Uh, we need good news. We need good news. <laughs> it's now my distinct pleasure to introduce Gordon Quinn, the founder and artistic director of Kartemquin Films, an organization that for 45 years has been telling stories that humanize issues, raise consciousness, and change perceptions about the world around us. You know, George Stoney should be in his traditional seat on the front row for this. He would have absolutely loved this. Gordon and the team at Carr Temkin refused to have their work consigned to a real or virtual documentary shelf. When Carr Temkin ro rolls out a film, they hit the road, screening their films in community centers, local theaters, and film festivals. That commitment to community has put Cartemquin on the documentary map with works like Hoop Dreams in the mid-1990s, its story of two inner city teens pursuing their dreams of playing in the NBA. This past year, Cartemquin released A Good Man about dancer, choreographer Bill T. Jones, a film that delves into the heart of the creative process. I highly recommend that you look at this. I was absolutely transported by it. And at a time of escalating violence in our city, The Interrupters, also released last year, takes to the streets with three Chicagoans trying to protect against the violence they once perpetrated. These films join a growing and much awarded body of work at Cartemquin. But to me, the most aptly named award was the Chicago Film Association's Big Shoulders Award for an outstanding service to the film community and the world. I'm proud of the kinsmanship the PEG movement has with Gordon. Close to 30 years ago, he joined with hundreds of Chicago residents and groups to fight for CanTV's creation. He later served on CanTV's board of directors, and this past year, he actively advocated for public benefits in the RCN renewal with a mem as a member of Committee for uh, Media Access, a large group of residents who joined together to fight for equity in the RCN deal. His personal commitment to media justice, his advocacy for an independent artistic process, and his belief in the power of people speaking in their own voices are principles that we share. It's an honor to introduce someone who, whose actions contribute to the movement for an equitable, just, creative, accessible media system in this country. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Gordon Quinn. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be running my own media here, so we'll hope for the best. Um, I, of course, go way back, not as far back as George did, uh, and you're going to hear more about him later, but he was a good friend of mine, and we've seen a lot of uh, technological changes over the years. Um, I'm a documentary filmmaker, as you just heard. And our films have been released in theaters. They play a lot on public television. But when I first learned, and I actually heard about it first, or at least the underlying values uh, from George Stoney, what a vision for people making their own media 
And people making their own media in a place, coming together in the community to create. It's one thing when we make a film, and Barbara said, people speaking in their own voice, and that's very important for us. But it's another thing when people have access to the technology to speak in their own voice through their own volition. That's a very different kind of thing. And so I want to speak a little bit about some of the underlying principles that I think uh, sort of are important to all of our movements that deal with media in a democratic society. And at the end, I'm going to talk about a few uh, more technical uh, and advocacy matters. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time uh, for question. Um, I believe in democracy. I believe in documentary. And I believe in broadcast. And I consider access media a kind of broadcast. Uh, I think that these things are under attack right now. Uh, and I think we have to think carefully about the role that they play in our democratic process. As we, the DOC and community media makers, are under attack, they say that we are not needed. The internet makes, takes pl the place of it all. But when you look at the core values, we know how critical we are to the survival of our democracy. Independent producers and access centers are there in the digital world innovating to express diversity, to give voice to, and to bring people into community. In our own city, we have shows like Chicagogo, uh, a kind of uh, very exciting alternative to Sesame Street. We have a vibrant and old uh, youth media project, uh, the community television networks, Hard Copy, Free Spirit Media, and many other youth media organizations are doing tremendously uh, exciting work uh, in enabling young people not only to have a say, but to understand how the tools work that involve, engage them in having a say, say and reaching what they consider or feel is their constituency. Um, at the heart of what we do, is human storytelling, storytelling about people. And I'm going to show a few clips uh, from our movies. I've got uh, three short clips here. The first one from my very first film, uh, Home for Life, which was in an old age home. Uh, and then I'm going to show a clip from The New Americans, a seven hour series that we did for public television. And the clip I'm going to show, Pedrito saying goodbye. Uh, was really from the very first, uh, it, it, it's a clip that somehow all of what we were trying to say in that seven hour series, most of it's in this one little uh, 75 second clip. So with any luck, this is going to work. Uh, okay, oh wait, I have to use this. As you can see, I'm... Uh, Mine, you didn't wear a skirt yet here? Huh? You didn't oh, yeah. wear a skirt? Here, here. You want to wear this tomorrow? This is Mark. Okay. Well, I've got one on. I don't know if it's right, Mark well, or not. Well, all right, wait. Believe not me. Mark, you have to we'll get We'll leave it in her drawer, honey. She'll I'm trying to drawer. organize. Don't all see. right. This is, uh, where should I put this? On your night table here? Don't go on the... Ma, yeah. I'll put it on the night table. Yeah, and it can be a... Oh, Lord, no. <laughs> Honey, put this bag in your mother's drawer. I have another glove at home that matches this. Take him back and bring it with you. Okay. You get the pair. All right. Was this marked? Is this the marked one? Which one? No, I think Wally said he's going to take this home. And this is able and told Wally to bring it. In the well, home. Wally was working tomorrow. Well, stop off for a minute. On the way to work, he'll run up and say hello. It'll and be he'll... tomorrow. It'll be, uh... Maybe Friday. Do you want me to do anything else in your closet? Yeah, you better get that over. Okay, this next clip is from the Mexican story of the New Americans. Es 
Sí, él, él estuvo aquí con ustedes, ¿verdad? Pero ustedes estaban de primero y él iba de segundo. Ya se fue a despedir de sus compañeros. Y él ya se va a Estados Unidos, se va con toda su familia. Y se viene a despedir. Y se fijan que está triste, ¿verdad? Porque ya se va. Porque él estuvo muy a gusto aquí con nosotros. ¿Y si tienes ganas de irte? No. ¿No tienes ganas de irte? Pero ya cuando estés allá te va a gustar. Ahorita, no, ahorita dices, no tengo ganas de irme porque no conoces. Muchas gracias, maestra, porque qué, usted me enseñó a escribir y a saber una letra. Ay, Pedrito, ya. Ya me... Muchas gracias, maestra. Ya, mijito, ya nada, ¿eh? Adiós. Sí, mijito. Pues ya también me hiciste llorar a mí, mijito, que te vaya muy bien. Espero que no vuelvas a verme. Sí, hijo, a ver cuánto vuelves, ¿eh? Amor, ya cuando estés bien grandote vas a volver, ya no te voy a conocer. Ándale, <risa> pues, que te vaya bien, mijito. A ver, vamos a darle un aplauso a Pedrito porque ya se va. And this last one is just a clip that I threw in. Uh, it's also from the New Americans, and I think it's something that we all know uh, is important to our work. Stop. Stop. I know, but how do you, I know you're not doing anything wrong, but how do you see it? If a child is in the street, he will be afraid, right? لازم تدعس البريك. انزل انت وهم بالشارع عشان ابقى اسوق وبعدين اقف. But I think George Stoney would have understand what's so important in these clips, which is they're, they're looking at the subtleties of human life and they're looking at what oftentimes is left out of other kinds of media. Um, one of the things I love about access media is so often you're seeing little bits and pieces of things that are just, they forget, they're left out. It's what happens uh, kind of in the cracks of our society. Um, in all the years that I knew George, I forgot to ask him if he knew John Dewey, because John Dewey is where it all began for me. And if you'll suffer with me and my bad eyes for a moment, I want to read you four quotes from Dewey, because for me, they really get at what underlies the values that I think we share as documentary filmmakers and as access producers and as cable access institutions. Uh, one, which anyone who's gotten a proposal from Cartempwin, this is in, I'd say, 90% of our proposals, we quote this. Artists have always been the real purveyors of the news, for it is not the outward happening in itself which is new, but the kindling by it of emotion, perception, and appreciation. We are beginning to realize that emotions and imagination are more potent in shaping public sentiment and opinion than information and research. And I think that's never more true than in the times we are living. Uh, these, all these quotes, by the way, are from uh, Dewey's Public and the, Pro Public's, the Public and Its Problem, which was published in 1927. Uh, it was I read it as a college student in the 60s at the University of Chicago, and it really changed my life. It really changed what I decided, well, what I knew I was going to do with my life. Um, another quote, because he also spoke about community, and I think the connection between community and media is critical, and I think we're at a critical juncture now to understand that community is a place, it's where people come together. And that the internet is a wondrous thing, we all use it. One of the things I think that your access centers are doing and that your movie, movement is doing is trying to make that connection between people working in groups, coming together, being in face-to-face -face contact with each other, and also using the internet in very innovative ways to underscore that and to make it happen and to make it more effective and powerful. In its deepest and richest sense, a community must always remain a matter of face-to-face -face intercourse. 
This is why the family, the neighborhood, have always been the chief agencies of nurture, where ideas are acquired to lay hold of the roots of a character, of character. Uh, and then one more quote, if you'll just, uh, I actually have two more here, if you'll bear with me. Signs, symbols, language, and the means of communication by which a fraternally shared experience is ushered in and sustained. But the winged words of conversation in intimate intercourse have a vital import lacking in the fixed and frozen words of written speech. The final actuality of inquiry is accomplished in face-to-face -face relationships by direct give and take. Unless local community life can be restored, the public cannot adequately resolve its most urgent problem, to find and identify itself. And that's really why I started doing what I did, making documentaries and forming an organization that's a center for people to come together uh, and make documentaries. And it's also why I've been a longtime supporter of community media from its early days in Chicago. Um, Barbara alluded a little bit to how CAN-TV came into being. Uh, one of the things that happened here in Chicago is we were able to learn a lot from the rest of the country. This was both fortunate and maybe a little unfortunate. Uh, the reality is, is that there was so much feeding frenzy around the cable franchise that we actually had aldermen who had been caught taking bribes, gone to jail, served their time, got out, and we still did not have cable in Chicago. <laughs> so we had a lot of time to see what you were doing in other parts of the country, see where what would make for a good ordinance. And we had this wondrous coalition. I'd never been involved in anything. I'd been in media about 20 years because it was from across the political spectrum. We had all of the, all, any kind of church that you can think of saw potential to get their word out over the pu uh, public access. We had the gay movement, which was just beginning to feel, uh, you know, kind of that it wanted to present itself to be a part of the public discourse. Um, we had veterans and every kind of advocacy group that you can think of, and all the minorities were represented. And people got it. We didn't even have cable. We didn't even have access. We would have meetings of 100 and 125 people uh, where the room was filled with leadership of all of these organizations as we wage the battle for a good franchise agreement and ultimately what resulted in, in CAN-TV. So I think, again, this vital resource, this vital public resource that we all know comes from the ability to, of cities to, to offer franchises is critical uh, to be defended. Um, Let's see, maybe I'll skip over some of this because I think Barbara, and I want to get to the end uh, so we have a little time for question. Uh, community access is about communities forming and giving them access to express their values and build their communities. Access centers are where people come together to make their own media. Training and working on each other's shows is a key aspect of what happens in access centers. Um, I'm, I always find it that wondrous moment when people from, who may have very different political perspectives, they may have not come into any content, but it's like, oh yeah, okay, I'll run camera on your show if you'll do that, you know, and they're all working around this fundamental kind of communication. And they're all seeking an audience over the access cable system. And in the early days, uh, a phrase I'm not particularly fond of, but they used to talk about narrow casting. Um, and the way I really think about it is, is that they are finding a community. They are finding a, a community that may be very small, that may be larger, but it's a community of people that resonate with the kind of work they're doing. Um, 
they are particularly important uh, places for youth to get their first experience with media. Uh, we have a very active intern program uh, at Cartemquin, and we, we recruit, we get now get 60 or 70 applications for four to six slots a semester. But a great number of the people who come into our intern program are young people who got their first experience, their first training at some access center across the country and then went on to, to study it in school and, and other places. Um, I think I may have skipped over a part here, but I, I'll just come back to it that, you know, in sort of wrapping this portion up, I think that we need to be aware of some of the threats we face right now, and we need to think about and speak about the underlying values that are behind community media, because those values are incredibly important to our larger democratic society. And I think that this movement does a terrific job of reminding the public that it's not just about me making my show. It's not just about my cable access show. It's not just about my voice. It's about what democracy needs to work. And it needs places where people can come together and learn about what it means to make media and to seek a community that you're trying to reach. Um, let's see if I, yeah, I did. Okay. So now what I want to do um, is I want to talk about a few what I call technical matters. I mean, I'm really talking about, I want to talk a little bit about ethic, ethics and I want to talk about advocacy. Um, and for your field, there may be some differences, but we, know how, we all know how to adapt tech to our core values. In a world dominated by very big market players who claim ownership of almost everything, we have to be vigilant in defense of our First Amendment rights, specifically fair use. So you've heard about, and you're probably going to hear a lot about the franchise process today. But there's also important battles to be waged, and we waged it within the documentary community, and we, and we won, to be able to use the images and the symbols and the trademarks and all of the things that people say are copyrighted, that they say you can't use, to be able to participate in the culture of our community. Um, this is really laid out in, oh, now I can't remember the article. It's either 21 or 17 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I highly recommend that document to you. The article that I'm speaking about speaks to intellectual property. And one of the things that it says, which I'll just paraphrase, is that everyone has the right to participate in the culture of their community. That's a human right. It can't be taken away from you. In the same uh, section, they say everyone has the right to the moral and material benefits of the art, the science, the things that they have made. Now, if you think about it, and that's where copyright comes from, those two things are in contradiction. Um, and it's the balance between the two that's at the heart of what is necessary for a healthy democracy. Um, actually, before I talk about fair use, I just because so I don't forget it, because this is a particularly important audience, and I'm actually going to show a clip. I just want to put in a plug for preservation, that you really need to think about saving your material and getting your producers to save their material. I am going to show a couple more clips. In fact, I'm going to show one any minute now. I didn't turn the lights on. <laughs> uh, I don't think. Um, but I just want to show you something from a brief clip from the Bill T. Jones film that Barbara mentioned, uh, because I think it illustrates what I'm talking about. So hopefully they'll be able to turn the lights out. You 
American steel workers' right to strike is being sold out, and we won't take it lying down. Let's look back and see how this most basic workers' right is being lost and what we can do to win it back. For several years, there have been secret negotiations between I.W. Abel and management to sell out our right to strike. To soften us up for the blow, they showed their film, Where's Joe, in the mills just before they announced the no-strike pact. I'm Michael Zansky from Local 1010, and along with many of you, I saw through this propaganda. At Inland Steel's Indiana Harbor Works, our membership was vocal in denouncing the so-called experimental agreement. I'm not about to be scared by a movie into giving up my only real right as a worker. I became involved with the District 31 Right to Strike Committee, which is one of many rank-and-file groups across the country that are fighting to see that this last great sellout is not successful. Let's look at parts of the movie, Where's Joe?, made by the companies in I.W. Abel. Then we'll show you what we found out about the real problem in the industry from talking with other workers and doing our own research. First, a piece of the movie. Where's Joe? Where's Sam? Dan? John? Al? Where are 130,000 men we used to work with? Yeah, I saw the movie Where's Joe, and I think it's a farce. You see, they, they, made, they was a captive audience to start with. You didn't have a choice. You were told, you go to this certain, certain place and see this movie. You know, I mean, they, they didn't have a, a choice. And I believe now that they would even even have trouble forcing a guy to even go see it, even though they paid him and, and everything else to go see the movie. Yeah, hey, I think it's... Uh clear as to what happened to Joe. I think it's the uh, stepped up automation in the plants. This next piece was done by Judy Hoffman. Uh, it was done in the 70s when we first got the Sony reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. And we had been making films for about 10 years at this point. We were working at a very high level of film production and uh, you know editing and that kind of thing. And we were approached by a community, uh, by a union really, uh, who had gone out on strike. <clears throat> and they felt, they, they worked in an unemployment office, and they felt nobody else knew what they were about, nobody else knew what they were doing, and they wanted to let everybody in the unemployment offices all across the city <clears throat> know what they were doing. And so we made this tape. She literally edited it in the camera. I was trying to explain this to a young person, one of our interns the other day, and it was, I realized she'd never even edited tape. She was born into the digital world. And so as I was explaining that we would roll the tape back to the point in the interview where we thought it, we could end it, and then we'd start recording the next person. Uh, and I had to explain to her, no, I want to leave all the glitches in in the piece so that people can see how we put it together. So let's see if I can successfully get this to play. We shall not be moved in As most of you know, Local 1006 is on strike at Local Office Number 70. The membership of that office voted to walk out after their union stewards and key union activists were either fired or transferred for protesting the work on Saturday and Sunday or else rule. As they should have, our members viewed management's actions as a bold and callous attempt to bust the union at local office number 70. But the union at local office 70 is standing up well under attack as the members have the unity and determination necessary for ultimate victory. Chuck, do you think you can uh, tell us a, a little about uh, how this uh, walkout came about? Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a little history. Only six or seven people of our entire base staff are working in that office now. With the support from other people and other offices, we can win this strike. If we win, the union wins. We become a strong union, a strong collective bargaining agent that the state has to deal with. Hi. Um, what's your name? My name is Pat Salgado. Okay. And you've been working at Local 70? 
Yeah. For about how long now? Uh, six months, including the temporary time and the other intermittent time. Oh, you were temporary. What was it like uh, working there for what? Uh, well, I was hired temporary, working for six twenty-two a month. I worked uh, from January 27th to March the 1st. I was made intermittent before my temporary time was up, and I was put down to five ninety-seven a month. Mm -hmm. uh, all the time that I was working, I was constantly being switched from job to job, being used for interpreter, for filing, for uh, typing, for using the switchboard, for anything they could use me for. Uh, you never knew who your boss was. They had so many bosses telling you what to do. That's just about how everybody was treated. We were, you know, very into our craft of what we were doing. Uh, we went to film festivals. We were into the art of filmmaking. And now we're working with this very crude equipment. Uh, you can barely edit anything. Um, the picture and the sound quality leaves a lot to be desired. And I remember taking Where's Joe around on the far south side of Chicago where the steel, markers, steel mills are. We were showing it to groups of workers in their homes. We were showing it uh, in bars uh, across the street from the Union Hall. And we would hook it up to their television. Whatever was there, we would hook it up so that we could show it on. Because the televisions in those days were huge and un unwieldy. And we didn't all have iPads. And I remember having to explain to people, that particularly once in a living room, they're looking at it and they're like, this is before the VCR, this is before cable, this is before any of that. And they're like seeing it on their TV, they think everybody's seeing it. They think the whole neighborhood is seeing it. I'd explain, no, it's just here in your living room. That's all, that's all you're seeing it. Um, but the lesson that I learned, because when we showed this film, people were riveted. Pe you could hear a pin drop. And the discussions afterwards were powerful and moving and relevant. And I think it's one of the most important lessons that we, in community media, that you don't judge all audiences the same. Uh, when our program show on public television, we have a, sometimes several million people are, are watching our program. Um, and it's broadcast, and one thing that I still think is important is, is that several million people are watching it, and some people are talking about it the next day. They all have seen it, and so they have something to respond to in that community way. But when I was showing Where's Joe, I was sometimes showing it to 15 people, 50 people, and their livelihood was at stake. Their future was at stake. And so... You don't judge all audiences the same. They're what's at stake and what people have in, to win or lose in a particular issue can make a tremendous difference in terms of how you view them as an audience and how important it is for them to be able to get the information that can be contained in your media. Uh, and so I think it's very important to think about audience in that way. Um, now I'm going to show a couple of clips, and I'll try to be really brief about this, but I want to talk a little bit about fair use. Um, I skipped over preservation. I didn't show you the clip, but I think you get the idea, even from these two clips, that holding on to your material is really important. When we did the film about Bill T. Jones, we found these old VHS videotapes of some of his and uh, Arnie's very earliest work. And we were able to include that into our film. And it's really, really powerful. And it's really important. And as you, your producers are making work today, or as you're making work, nobody knows what part of that will be critical to our history moving forward. And I, so I think that we're struggling now ourselves internally to deal with 45 years of archival stuff that's in storage and we don't even know what we have and we've, we've started to, to go through our archive and to catalog it. So I know you can't hold on to everything. I know that there are, you know, space and financial constraints, but I just wanted to put that plug in. Okay, fair use. Uh, just so I know, how many people have know what fair use is? Can I just get pretty much everyone? Good. That's, that's great. Uh, in documentary filmmaking, 
when I began, we used fair use all the time. Up until the mid, up until about 1980, you would see it in our films. Images where we had used our sound or a piece of media, where we had used somebody's copyrighted work in our work to comment on it, to critique it, to parody it, to put something in historical context. But the big rights holders, mostly based in Hollywood, Disney and Sony and, uh, you know, all of the, 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 not precursors to Viacom, began to threaten to sue. They didn't threaten us. They threatened the gatekeepers. They threatened the broadcasters, PBS, and they threatened the insurance companies where we would get the insurance that the broadcaster was required. And by the end of the 80s, we had lost the, the right to use our fair use. And to be a professional, and you've probably all lived through this in your own centers because you seem to be familiar with it, uh, people will come in and say, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. It was being taught wrong in the schools, uh, in, you know, the, uh, in NBC, and I saw this myself in their standards and practice rule, uh, the 32nd rule there, you know, that you can use 30 seconds of, of a clip but no more. Well, there never was any such rule. They made it up themselves. And I want to show you the consequences of this. Uh, if I can find this. I want to tell you that I love you very much. I'm very proud of you. It seemed like and I was 18 just yesterday. Here, happy birthday. I love you. Hey, hey. Aww. Happy birthday. I love you, too. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, girl. Let's go. Happy birthday. Let's go. Happy birthday. 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 Uh, and you can see that um, from an artistic point of view, it really undercuts uh, the scene. Well, a good friend of mine, Pat Ofter Heidi, uh, had founded the Center for Social Media at American University. And she hooked up with an intellectual property lawyer, professor there, a lawyer who um, said, you know, the problem, the two of them got together and they said, the problem is we don't need to go to the courts. We don't need to go to Congress and get the law changed. We have to stand up as a community. They were saying to us that you have to stand up as a community of documentary filmmakers and assert your rights. And it was great. Uh, as soon as I heard this, I was on board. I was like, let's go to the ramparts. We just have to get organized, and as you people are organized, and speak for our community. And so they held meetings across the country. We sponsored a couple at Cartemquin. And we talked about how we viewed this balance. Because we're, all, we're on both sides of the issues. We're copyright holders, and we're also copyright users. And so where's the balance? How do we define it? And we just, they, they published uh, for us. It was really written out of our expression and vetted by lawyers. And we published the Documentary Filmmaker Statement of Best Practice. Uh, in fair use. So now we had this thing that said this is the best practice in our field, that if anybody ever did sue us. By the way, if you look at the case law, these big companies never sued anybody uh, in, unless, the, unless what the person was doing was so egregious that even we would all look at it and say, yeah, he should be sued. Uh, you know, the guy who took uh, a bunch of songs from Elvis films and strung them together and released it as a feature film called it Elvis Sings. That's one of the few cases that actually went to court. Uh, but the kind of thing that we were doing, they never sued, they just threatened people. They frightened everybody. And as soon as we stood up and said boo, we found that within a few years we had our rights back. And I'll just show one more clip. Uh, this is from our film In the Family. It's about the BRCA breast cancer film. Uh, <clears throat> the breast can BRCA breast cancer gene, and 
over the years, I had had many discussions with people about magazine covers. Uh, and so I'll just show, let's see if I can find this one. Listening to Nicole brought me back to when I was 13 and my mom was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. I didn't want any of my friends to know. I remember at my birthday party that year, I was relieved that she was wearing her wig and that no one would know she was sick. It was 1986, the same year Gilda Radner was diagnosed. And all of a sudden, the whole world was talking about ovarian cancer. In many of our films, we use things from the mainstream media. We use, uh, you know, the news. We use uh, the national news and uh, Peter Jennings. He's no longer with us. But whoever the anchor is, I forget their names. Uh, we use the anchor. You know, people will tell you, oh, well, they have a union contract. You can't use him, or you can't use his voice, or you can't use the underlying music. If it's fair use, if you're using it within the confines of the best practice statement, you can use all of it. Um, all of the rights are, are protected, all of the underlying rights. And... You know, I, I know that there is, I gather that there is not a best practice for access users. I think the principles that are in our documentary filmmaker statement uh, probably apply uh, in the same way to your movement. But to give you an idea how this thing took off, once we published ours, people who teach film and video published one. Um, all kinds of other people came into it. There's one for poetry. There's, I did not know this, but I just found out because I spent a year in the dance world. There is a best practice for fair use in dance. Um, so communities have come together to find their own question of where this balance lies and publish these statements, which then gives you a very powerful tool if anybody, when you insert a right, you can always, someone can always sue you, you know. I always have to explain to people, no, it's not a contract. It's a right. And you have to be able to, will, and there are <clears throat> a lot of law clinics around the country. We work a lot with uh, the University of Southern California right now. And they are um, willing to defend you if someone ever actually does sue you and take you into court, because there is always that fear, well, I'm just an individual producer, or we're a tiny little access center, and what if somebody really big comes after us? And there are people that are willing to defend you, but uh, I highly recommend the Center for Social Media's website, uh, and <clears throat> that you go to the fair use section and look at some of these best practice statements, uh, both the documentary filmmakers one and also I think the internet. Uh, there's a particular one for uh, posting to the internet that people got together and published and both of those I think would be very useful uh, for your field. Um, I just want to talk about one other uh, aspect of this because we were just testifying, it, testifying about it recently before the Copyright Office in um, Washington, D.C., <clears throat> which is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And one of the things that's in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which probably most of you are in some ways familiar with, or at least this aspect, that if you break the encryption on a DVD, the mere fact that you have broken the encryption means that you're in violation of the law. Well, that's a very problematic law. We may want to use a clip for perfectly legal purposes, but the only way we can access it is to get it off of that DVD. And the Copyright Office did realize that there was, you know, it's the problem that they get into when these laws are written by lobbyists. But I think it's probably important uh, for your constituencies to understand sort of what the limitations and also what their rights are that there, are, there is an exemption out there. And I'm going to just show a clip that we used. I, I'll show two more clips, and then I'll just stop. Uh, if I can.
there is great beauty in impulses and movements. But my generation, we were interested in theatricality, psychology. A body like mine came into the field and was suddenly aware of being a black body, watched by white bodies. Now, this avant-garde I'm talking about, color is not important. It's all the mechanics of it, like animals. And I said, no, 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 no. Because it's not only, you're not only watching a body move, but there's a whole social, political, psychological construct that allows you and I to even be in the room together. Um, I'm going to close with a few comments about ethics. Um, and ethics, every field, I think, generates its own set of ethics. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with, I think, journalistic ethics, and I have great respect for journal ethics, journalistic ethics. But in our field, documentary filmmaking, we need a different set of ethics. Um, in a film like Hoop Dreams, where we spent four and a half years with those families in the making of the film, and then another five years just in the editing and the release of the film, um, we're involved with people in a very different way that people are in a news story. So I'm not going to show the clip to me, but I have a clip where you see a scene from the film where the lights are turned out uh, because they haven't been able to pay their bill, and so they're, they're living in the dark. And people ask, well, did you give the family money to turn the lights back on? And we like to be transparent. I said, yes, we did give them money to turn the lights back on, not just because we're filmmakers, you know, but because we're in a human relationship with that family over four and a half years. Um, we didn't license their life story. We didn't, you know, we didn't do it. We told them the film was never going to make any money, but we gave them that small amount of money to turn the lights back on. And that, I think, is, you know, that's consistent with how I think about ethics for our field. Um, John Nichols, uh, who writes on documentary, has what I think is a great way of thinking about this. He says, whenever you make media, and I think this is true for your producers too, you have a responsibility to your audience, to your community. For journalists, it's to get the story. Uh, in community media, it may be different kinds of things. It may be sharing. It may be being real. It may be providing people with... Uh, a, a, a view into something. It may even be just a kind of music that, that they want to see. But you also have a responsibility to the subjects of your films. That it's, everything is not okay. And it's not okay to cross every line. And so I think your field also needs to think about ethics. And one of the things I challenge documentary filmmakers with uh, you know, journalists have a very set procedure and they have fact-checking and they do not share their story with the subjects uh, before it's published, if it's a real journalistic story. And I understand those ethics and I respect them. But when I'm asking people to let me in to the most intimate aspects of their lives, that's a different thing. And what I tell people in a film like The New Americans, <clears throat> or what we told the families in Hoop Dreams, we said, we're going to share this with you, and we're going to share this with you and let you see it before anybody else sees it. And I, it depends on who the people are. Generally, if people are not people with some kind of power or agency, I basically say to them, we're going to have a real discussion. If there's something you don't like in the film, something you don't think should be there, there's going to be a real argument. We're really going to talk about it. You're really going to have to listen to me. But if I can't convince you that it has to be in the film, I'll take it out. Uh, with Bill T. Jones, with another film I did about an hour, an artist, these are people with power and with agency. So I often reverse that conversation. And I say, you know, I'm really going to listen to you. We're going to have a real argument about it. We will have real engagement about it. But in the end, I have to make the decision. So that's a way in which the particular nature of what we do helped us to evolve some, some ethical pr pr principles. And 
I want to show a clip. I'll just end with a clip. It's, it's kind of long. Uh, it's from a film we made. It's a couple of minutes, and it's from a film we call, made called Vietnam Long Time Coming. It's about a group of veterans who have been bicycling through Vietnam um, with their Vietnamese counterparts. So they start in Hanoi, and now they've come to My Lai. And for the first time, this very cohesive, very different politics within the group, but a very cohesive group has been split apart. And some of the veterans do not go in to My Lai. They feel it's going to be exploited for political reasons by the Vietnamese. Uh, and others have gone inside. And it's a long scene in the film. I'm just going to show you a moment with a father and a son outside of Milai. The father is a veteran. The son is a blind bicycle rider, and they ride on a tandem bike. And it raises the question of what do you do when someone asks you to stop filming? I don't know any veteran who wants to be here. Certainly not something. There's a program in school. Yeah, I can ex I can tell you though that is called Facing History and Ourselves. It's a a program where you look at sort of uncomfortable moments in history where human beings kind of went astray and committed atrocities. Um, and it's to kind of help kids understand that we have some scary parts within us that we have to make sure that we're always able to you know, keep a handle on in society. I mean, this was clearly an isolated, awful incident. And so I would hope it would never be taught as any kind of pattern. War's ugly enough, but uh, I mean, this just was one, one event which uh, it was kind of a disgrace to our country. It's understandable, actually, if you were out here on the battlefield and had seen many of your men, perhaps, slaughtered or but it's certainly not excusable do you have any bitterness over your time in the army you know i feel privileged to have had an opportunity to serve my country at a point in time i mean uh serving in peacetime is one thing but uh you know i had the privilege and that's the way i really view it i mean it wasn't uh it wasn't a high moment in a way, but uh, it was an important moment in my life. I'm glad I had the opportunity. I don't have any more. No, when you think about it deeply, you know. Peter, who was a partner of ours, was filming this, and he kept shooting. And Peter knew what he was doing. He took responsibility for that decision. If I'd been doing it today, I would too. But in the clip I showed you, the very first one, the laundry scene in Home for Life, which actually goes on for eight minutes in the film, which is an eternity in screen time in a documentary, it's a very painful scene. Uh, the son and daughter-in-law are racked with guilt about putting the mother that they've had in their home for 15 years in a home for the aged, even though it's a very good home. And nothing is discussed but laundry. And it's the fulcrum of the whole film because you understand that part of the reason that they seem to be treating her so badly is they're being driven by their guilt. And right in the middle of that scene, I'm a 24-year-old kid, I'm working on my first movie, 
the old woman stops right in the middle of the scene. And she says, I don't want to be in the movie anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. We'd all talked to it. We'd gotten releases. We'd talked to the family. We'd done all that kind of stuff. And because this is film, you see that the camera, sh I, sh I want to get this out of our archive and actually make a teaching piece out of it. Because the camera stops, the screen would go dark, and the sound continues to roll in the quarter inch tape recorder. And you would hear this 24 year old kid explaining to this confused old woman how important it is for her to be in the film. And I know she's struggling and she's having a hard time, but this is going to help other people. Uh, like her coming into the home, you know, they're going to make things better and that kind of thing. And she says, oh, okay, okay, I'll be in the movie. And the camera goes back on and the scene continues as if nothing had happened. Well, at 24, I didn't understand that I had to take responsibility for what I had just done. She's 83, I'm 24. I have all the power in that situation. And the media is a powerful tool. And we in the documentary world, I think, have to be aware of that. Uh, we have to be aware of the reality of the power relationships in our field. And I think that can also be important in access media to make people aware of the, that the, it's not that you can't, sometimes people raise a question, who should be able to make a film about who and all of those kind of questions. And what I think is most important is that people be prepared to take responsibility for the decisions that they make. Um, and one of the things that I, you know, I'll just close by saying we'll open it up to questions is that I think is so important about access centers is that it's a place where people come together in a community made up of many different communities across a region or a city uh, to confront each other uh, and to really work on those kinds of things. So I don't know if we have time for questions or not. I'll take a couple of questions, and I'll may, I may need help uh, seeing if anybody here. I think I see someone there. I'm not sure that I would handle it any differently now, the, but I might have. The point that I would have made, it, at 24, I thought all I needed to care about was convince her to let me go on filming. That was my only goal. Now I understand that there's a power relationship there and I have to take responsibility for what I did, what I did to her and what I did to her family. And that's the, really the point that I'm making. It's not that you can't do it, but know what you're doing it ask the question, what, sometimes I ask people, what do you think gives you the right to make a film about these people? Uh, when we did Hoop Dreams, the filmmakers were white and the subjects were African American. It was a relevant question. Not that they couldn't do it, but they had to know the answer. They had to have thought about it, or not even know the answer, but to have thought about it. So I'll take one more question. Uh, yeah. Um, well, some of it is on, I just was looking last night, and some of it from some other presentation I made is on CAN TV uh, online. Uh, and some of it is on our website, uh, cartemquinfilms.com. As you can tell, this is not a formal presentation. It's just not the way I speak. So I don't have like a written speech or anything. Uh, but most of it is al online in some form or another. And it's also online, some, some things that I've done at the uh, Center for Social Media org. So thank you. Thank you, Gordon. We appreciate you being here today to, to speak with us. And Gordon's going to stay around for a little while in case some of you have additional questions. I also just want to say it's really nice to see you again after all these years. Yes, I forgot to <laughs>
Um, I first met Gordon when I was working for Twin Cities Public Television 20 years ago, and we worked on the uh, movie Hoop Dreams together. So it was a wonderful experience. It's now my pleasure to welcome to the ACM um, a, a group based here in Chicago. You may have heard of them. Uh, the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, it's one of the nation's largest independent foundations. Through the support it provides, the foundation fosters the development of knowledge, nurtures individual creativity, strengthens institutions, helps improve public policy, and provides information to the public, primarily through support for public interest media. We're pleased to welcome Ann Mae Chung, Associate Director of Education for U.S. Programs for the MacArthur Foundation, to speak with you today. On May focuses on grants relating to public education and the implications for education of young people's use of digital media. Prior to joining the foundation, she was the education program officer at the CS Mott Foundation, where she partnered with the U.S. Department of Education and sought to provide optimum op opportunities for academic support and enrichment for young people to learn and develop beyond the classroom. Previously, she was the associate director at the National Institute on Out-of-School Time at the Center for Research on Women at Wellesley College. There she worked with the Corporation for National Community Service and the U.S. Department of Education and directed the Save the Children Out-of-School Time Rural Initiative. She is vice chair of the Board of Grant Makers for Education and previously served on the New Mexico Integrated School Services Initiative Advisory Board, the Citizen Schools National Education Policy Advisory Board, the Governor's Voices for Action Poverty Summit Advisory Committee in Michigan, the Mass 2020 Expanding Learning Time Advisory Board, and the National Partnership for Quality After School Learning Steering Committee, and she was chair of Bridges for the Future Genesis County Advisory Board. Please welcome on May Chung. We'll see if we can get the technology to work now. Okay. Thank you for the for the F five button. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, and um, I want to thank you um, for inviting me to speak today. Um, I am uh, not an expert um, in much of anything these days, being a program officer um, at foundations for the past 12 years, but I get the uh, unbelievable privilege of actually meeting experts across the country and the world, which is, is, is such a, a wonderful experience for me. So I, this morning, I had the opportunity to learn from Commissioner Krimble and uh, from Gordon as well about all the great work that's being done here in the city um, and across the country. Uh, and uh, I'm fairly new to Chicago, so it was wonderful to hear about uh, all the, uh, the good things that are happening in Chicago. So today, what I'm going to do is actually talk to you very briefly about um, some of MacArthur's investment in digital media and learning. And our focus has been on young people. So you get to hear a little bit about how we're supporting experts to do this. Um, the, uh, the framework for our grant making um, for this is actually embedded research. For those of you who know MacArthur, we are very strong on the research front. Um, and um, the frame that we are um, uh, talking about right now is what we're calling connected learning. And at the very simplest, what is connected learning? It's about reimagining the learning experience of young people across three dif different spheres of peer culture in terms of what matters to them the most, the things they want to get good at, their interests, and academics. And in doing so, it's about creating multiple entryways and multiple points um, to learning so that it will uh, open up more ways to create paths to career, academic, and civic engagement. So what I'm going to do today is actually describe briefly um, and show you what the experience looks like for young people when connections are made across the peer, youth, interests, and academics. And these experiences are ones that are enabled by digital media. And at the end of the day, this is the, the three spheres that we're talking about. At the end of the day, what we hope to see is that this approach actually leads to both kids learning core traditional skills that we often talk about, the core academics, and builds the skills and the capacities of what we know are necessary for the 21st century. 
So let me give you a background about how we started doing this work. Um, about um, five or six years ago, the MacArthur Foundation um, decided to approach digital media and learning in a different way. They had done a lot of traditional public education work in Chicago, and pretty much they would describe it as not great investments in public education. So they decided to start looking in the out-of-school time realm. And they began by asking one very simple question, which is, what exactly are young people doing with digital media and all those hours they spend working with it. So two big answers came out of this, actually, in terms of a study that was done by Mimi Ito um, called the Digital Youth Network. These are not going to be surprising to you. One was that spending time with friends, hanging out, was really important to them um, online. They're doing exactly what they do offline in the online spaces. They're gossiping, they're socializing, there's dating rituals that are occurring. There's absolutely nothing magical about what they're doing on Facebook. It's what kids used to do when they would hang out at the malls. They're also, at the same time, which is something new, they're learning technology skills. The second big thing that we learned um, from this study is that they're pursuing interests online. They're getting good at the things that they care about doing. They're in what our researchers are called interest-driven community spaces. They're showing up at game sites, fan fiction sites, chess or, chess or science sites, knitting, pottery, crafts, you name it. They are making, they're producing, they're creating, they're players, they're participants of some form. And they have the ability online also to share what they've done and provide feedback, thoughts, and comments to each other. It's that peer-to-peer -peer culture. One of the things you may have heard about is the Harry Potter um, uh, uh, Alliance. Um, I, anyone ha has anyone heard about this site at all? Okay, so it's a very interesting thing because it started out um, with hundreds and thousands of kids being interested um, in Harry Potter. And on this site, what you will find, you can see the stats there as well, that they are writing, they're sharing, they're critiquing, they're reviewing each other's work and others' work. So the creators of this site decided that they could take this a step further. So they decided they could actually mobilize the fans of the Harry Potter um, fans towards uh, making civic engagement part of a deep and lasting social change. So if you go onto this website, um, the Harry Potter Alliance site, you will see some of the things that they've been able to do together online in this way. The couple of examples of this, they've raised over 125,000 in just two weeks for Partners in Health in Haiti. They sent five cargo planes full of life-saving supports to Haiti. Another example is that they donated more than 87,000 books around the world, including 20,000 to community centers in the Mississippi River Delta. So this is just an example of what this online learning has done, just both here in the States, but internationally as well. The other thing that researchers found uh, in this effort uh, is that the online movement into interest-driven communities often happen when kids are actually hanging out with each other or their friends or their siblings. They see what their friends are doing, they lurking, you know, as is a term that you all have heard probably. Then they would start lurking and then they would mess around a little bit, they would tinker with it and see if it's something they might really want to do. And then they would jump in and geek out is what we call it, and really try to become competent at a particular skill. And so there was a study that came out that was actually called Hanging Out, Messing Around, and Geeking Out. And this is a study of how, how kids um, are spending their time in, uh, with digital media and learning. So all this research together, we started to say, you know, there is this connection not surprising, between um, uh, connecting the interest that kids have in the peer culture. So MacArthur decided to partner with the Chicago Public Library here and test this notion of what, do you, what happens when you uh, uh, take the peer culture piece and the interest-driven piece and what happens when you um, embed digital media into that. So at the Chicago Public Library, um, the branch downtown, there's a 5,000 square foot space, teen space, dedicated to teens, um, that is noisy. You can eat in this space. It's full of great toys, digital media toys. And the secret ingredients in this space is actually the mentors in this space. And kids are hanging out. They're messing around. They're geeking out. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples of this.
Brother Mike introduced the project to us at first. He wanted us to create a three minute video about violence in Chicago. But me and my friend Jalen, we kind of thought that you can't really fit a such a broad topic into a three minute video. So we kind of expanded it and that's how the project came to be. Do you feel as if violence can be stopped? I don't know. If violence can be stopped, that would be a miracle. Yeah, because uh, I think like 2010, like 500 something people died. And I, I'm scared that I might be that. In America, according to the Chicago Sun Times, as of Tuesday, Chicago had racked up 426 murders. Every time we walk, they like try to walk up against us, walk up on us, and like do some stupid stuff, but we wouldn't mind it. Last night was violence all over the city. 20 people were shot in just 12 hours. Violence in Chicago is like something that I really hate. When you think about Chicago, you think about tall buildings, Ferris wheels, and businessmen. For most people, this isn't the real Chicago. The real Chicago is filled with crime, drugs, game bangers, projects, childhoods without father, 14 year old dropouts. On the FBI's national list of the most dangerous cities in the USA, Chicago is ranked number 15. Chicago closed 2009 with 509 homicides, more than 308 soldiers who died in 2008 in Iraq. More than 15 schools on the south side are in Illinois' worst schools annual list. Chicago teenagers face danger in and out of school. There are many organizations that fight to stop the violence in Chicago, such as Cease Fire and Cure Violence. The question that is always raised is, is there really a solution to ending the violence in Chicago? With the documentary, the teenagers I interviewed were my sources, and I don't think that in the paper I could have gotten my point across more. And the video could actually persuade teens to, because a teenager would rather sit down and watch a, a video about violence in Chicago than sit down and read a 10-page ten, a ten paper about violence in Chicago. I pinpointed little things that could stop violence, such as video games and the videos that you see on BET because for instance the videos you see on BET they're persuading you to be violent so if I say hey look they're trying to persuade you to be violent do you want to become a statistic like them they'll probably say no so they won't listen to what they're saying until Lil Wayne is telling them or whatever the rappers are telling them so I feel as if creating a documentary and actually telling them what they're listening to and how they can stop it will help them make better choices <laughs> When you turn on your TV, all you see is rappers flaunting their wealth and their girlfriends. When you actually listen to what the rappers are saying, it's petrifying. Birdman and Jada Kids call females out of their names, while 50 Cent talks about how many people he shot up. Lil Wayne talks about how much weed he smokes a day, and Lloyd Banks talks about how many cars he has. When you ask most rappers if they believe they influence by it, they say no. When you ask the teenagers, the answer is the other way around. They do persuade teens to be violent because they be like, shoot that, you know, that nigga, that kill that, you know, stuff like that. So I think that teenagers will listen to it. They trying to get dread like they trying to um, rap like them, and then they trying to do violence like them. I surveyed 20 teens and 10 adults. 87% of them said they believe gangster rap is one of the reasons behind violence. So we reached our first cure. Less gangster rap equals less violence. We didn't have to create a documentary. Other kids were creating music. So I was like, okay, I'll just put your music pieces in my video so it could tie in together. Um, like, I don't even know one of the kids' pieces I put in, but he's at U Media. He's a high schooler, and the song was really, really good. So I put his in there. I put a couple of my friends' videos in there. So it was really cool, and they were really excited about it. Do you feel as if video games persuade children to be violent? Well, yes, not really. Uh, yeah, because I have to. How long ago it was with a child, he had to his mother's car, and he got to say he got it from the video game. Well, yes, 
realize at a young age you absorb things. So say you're playing a video game and fight where you just play as character games, just slash people's heads off and then just fight them up with a gun. But um, at a young age you absorb that and say there's nothing wrong with violence. I think it starts at home. I think video games is just a way to pass time and have fun. If, if a child is persuaded to be violent by video games, then they really shouldn't. Well, I, I don't know if video games influence violence as much as violence influences video games. But yeah, everyone was sharing everything. We were helping each other all the time. Like if someone needed to put a, a video in one of their PSAs, I helped them with that. Or if I needed an interview, I would just go steal them out the studio from Brother Mike. And yeah, so everyone was really helping each other. It was a huge collaboration, really. Do you feel as if in all of the video games they have to do violence, killing people, stabbing people, or ban, that the world would be a better place and there would be less violence? Not really. I mean, you still have the media, which, like, even in your normal average cartoon, if someone gets hurt, that's still violence. Or if someone gets killed in the cartoon, that's still violence. Anything that has to deal with violence is pretty much set in media. So you don't think that the content and Grand Theft Auto isn't bad for a 12-year-old to be watching? Well, uh, I think I think it's just, it really should be an age limit where children can play games like that. But really, it it really doesn't have. I don't think it has an effect on uh, children's. Grand Theft Auto, of course. I. Like, did know a lot of things about the way my friends thought because they act so hard all the time. But then we sat down and talked about violence. I was like, wow, so you really are kind of a soft person. So, yeah, it was a, it was a fun experience. And I got to work with my friends. So, yeah. I honestly do feel like, like, you media and remix run and stuff like that is helping. And, yeah, we are taking our culture back if you really think about it that way. Um, so U Media Chicago is actually one of our demonstration sites. It's one of it's our flagship site in terms of that. One of the things that it's it's, it's spurred is actually a great interest by libraries and museums across the country to develop uh, similar types of space for teens. Um, and many of them actually at CPL now are thinking about we need to create this experience throughout the library for not just teens but for adults too as well. So we partnered with the Institute of Museums uh, and Library Services, which is the federal organization, and right now we're funding um, up to 30 of these learning labs across the country that spread the kind of, of ideas and principles that you see here, and the hope is that it inspires more in, uh, innovations of this kind. So um, if you want to learn more about it, you can go to www.media.org and um, see some of the sites that we're funding, um, as well as some of the, the, the examples. Uh, the other uh, thing that I want to share with you um, is that we recently um, uh, funded a study um, through one of our research networks called Youth Participatory uh, Politics. And it was just released last month, um, and it was research that was conducted from February to July of 2011, and it's a represented sample of 3,000 American youth across the country. And what it told us in this study was that four years ago, social media proved to be a key factor in driving youth and minority vote, without a doubt, as all, we all remember. And what the study shows us is that substantial numbers of people are now engaged in what this, uh, the, the principal investigators are calling participatory politics. They're starting new political groups online. They're writing or circulating blogs about political issues. They're forwarding political videos to friends and colleagues. And I'm sure you've heard of some of the things that have happened around the world, around what's hap what happened in Egypt this year is an example of that. And what's uh, different about this is that this is giving um, youth in particular an opportunity to 
be interactive, peer-based, and it's not connected to any elite or formal institution. It's all on their own. And so they're giving, getting greater control of their voice and potential influence about um, politics that they've never been able to have before. So more of this work is going to be coming out about how youth are engaging in, in these activities, and it will be interesting to see what actually happens um, in uh, uh, this next election. So you can see these are some of the key findings um, and uh, happy to share uh, with you. Uh, if you actually just look up participatory politics, new U media and youth action, you'll see the report that's come out. So I want to wrap up to actually tell you a little bit about what we've learned um, by working with U media um, in terms of that that has actually spurred work that we're doing in schools and with community-based organizations uh, in Chicago and New York in particular. And what we have found is nothing that will surprise any of you, but things that, need, that we need to be reminded about what works for kids is that there needs to be shared purpose. There need to be peers in the setting with a shared interest of purpose to keep them interested. And there must be peer-to-peer -peer communication involved too, so that, that there's value placed on the ability for peers to communicate with each other. Um, the third is that performance and feedback are absolutely critical, um, and the, it's got to be made visible. So in new media, there's actually no walls. Youth that are just hanging out and be, being social can actually see what other youth and their peers are doing that helps to engage them in those activities as well. Low barrier to participate. Everything, all the tools, equipment, and opportunities to collaborate are literally out in the open, and um, People just, kids just check it out with a library card, just like you would books, right? It's easy to walk up and join any situation in the UMedia site, and it's a way of getting kids engaged. Um, opportunities to lurk and tinker, again, um, ways to get kids interested. Uh, interests are not innate, they have to be cultivated, and so the mentors and the libraries in this space are absolutely critical for asking those prompting questions that kids get engaged. I think the last one is the mentors. This is something that is not going to be surprising to any of us. Mentors, young adults and older adults are absolutely critical to this. They play a huge role in getting kids to mess around in the space. They help kids trans trans uh, transition from the interest piece to actually identifying interests and to build the competencies that we need. So this is just briefly some of the work that we're supporting, but I wanted to give you all a sense of what that is. And so as you're thinking about uh, the efforts that you're doing is to think about the opportunity to engage youth in, in your work locally. That's it. Thank you. Good morning. Well, you know, we lost a really important person two weeks ago, George Stoney. Um, on your chairs uh, are some cards with a quote about George. We thought you might like that. I'm not going to talk a real long time because I don't think George would have wanted that either, okay? Rather, I'm going to share a few thoughts and then we're going to roll in and we're going to hear from George his, himself. Um, George was a champion of free speech and open media and, and George passed at his New York City home two weeks ago. He was 96. George was still producing films. George was still teaching. George was still advocating for public access and public media. This organization exists today because of his pioneering work in Canada and here in the United States. Uh, I was lucky enough in the early 70s to have a chance to mentor with George in a, in a MacArthur Foundation funded project in part at the Alternate Media at the NYU School of the Arts. I, I was just a kid from Iowa who got picked out of a bunch of people from around the country to be part of this program. It changed my life. He changed a lot of people's lives. He mentored thousands of people. He taught us to put video equipment into the hands of the public and to let their viewpoints come out to allow them to share, discuss, and air their thoughts. But, you know, what a lot of people don't know about George is that he was one of the preeminent film educators in the United States. 
Uh, he, uh, he was inducted as a, as a, a professor emeritus two years ago at NYU. Um, you all think of him as the father of access, but there's a lot of parts of George I think you don't know about. I was lucky enough to get to know those. Some other people in this room were lucky to get to know those parts of George. But that's part of what we want to share with you today. We want you to see the whole George, not just the piece that maybe we think about when we think about public access television. Um, he was an activist documentary maker. Um, his film, All My Babies, was in, inducted into the National Film Archives two years ago. Um, he had an Emmy Award winning film, We Shall Overcome. A lot of you probably might not know that about George. Um, George's commitments to social causes through his documentary work, his dedication to his students, and to the access movement was unwavering all the way to the end. Um, it was only about a month ago, I was lucky enough to, um, well, for years, he'd been trying to get me to come out to this birthday party that he and Betty had at Long Island on a farm at the end of June every year. And I always had, you know, some reason not to come or I was busy or whatever. But my dear friend, Rika Welsh, she said, you are coming this year. And she brought so I flew in from California. We picked up another woman from Nancy Larkin, who was also part of the Alternate Media Center program back in the early 70s. We all got in the car in Cambridge, and we drove to New London, and we got on the ferry, and, we went, and then we got off the ferry on Long Island, and we drove down to the party. And it was wonderful. There were 100, there's at least 100 people there from all walks of life, all there just to sort of celebrate together and talk and share and talk about what they're doing, all ages, little teeny babies, people who were George's age, and I think maybe one or two even slightly older. And we were all there together just having a nice party on a Sunday afternoon on Long Island, eating good food, talking, and seeing people in some cases that we hadn't seen in years. I hadn't seen David Shulman, for instance, a documentary, documentary maker who made um, several films about access and videos about access, and he works with the BBC, and I hadn't seen him in years. He showed up for George's party. But George's life was sort of like that. He was always reaching out. He was always sharing and listening and learning from others. His words, his work, his actions. And now his spirit will continue to inspire us in our activities to help this world be a more humane place. Now let's hear from George. Well, we look on cable as a way of encouraging public action, not just access. Uh, social change comes by the combination of use of media and people getting out on the streets or uh, getting involved. And uh, we find that if people make programs together and put them on the local channel, that gets them involved. In 1952, a 36-year-old director from North Carolina began making a film that would become a landmark in American nonfiction cinema. He dared to go where most white people wouldn't go, and that's to watch the birth of, of a baby in, in the middle of a town where there's racial tensions going on, and uh, to actually f film that, that birth. And when you consider the fact that he was going into the Deep South at a time when the racial divisions were hard, they weren't negotiable and he crossed the color line. Um, that was a very courageous thing to do. And it was dangerous not just for the Yankees coming on down to the south. It was dangerous for the people who were willing to work with George. The police pulling up in, in their vehicles and saying he couldn't be there. And I mean, when you watch that film, it, it gives me chills to this day, just to recall it. And we see all the tensions that build up to that one moment. And I remember sitting on the edge of my seat the first time I, I saw that, squirming and you know, going, oh my God, what's, is this baby going to come out or is it going to, what's going to happen here? You know, where are you thinking, George? What's going on and how did you do this? My 
when I saw the birth of the child, I almost wanted to leap up in my in my seat and go, "My God, that's incredible!" <laughs> I mean, watching the birth of a child is incredible anyway, but knowing what he went through to 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 do that and what those people went through to give him that that's that's a, a beautiful example of a of subject allowing themselves to be so vulnerable to allow him to be there with his camera at, uh, at that time of, of life and in the midst of that kind of racial tensions George is always talking about how your first collaborator in filmmaking are the people in front of the camera. You have to create a relationship with them. I think that George has such respect for the subjects and also it cares so much for the way the filmmakers interact with the subjects. He's being guided by what can I do to lift humanity to some higher level? What can I do to help? What can I, not what can I do to exploit, what can I do to profit, what can I do to make myself famous, but what can I do to help? That's a very important thing to, to, to communicate these days, very important. And to have him around as an example of that, not only to um, the younger filmmakers, but us older guys too, that that's something that we should be constantly keeping in our hearts, it's, it's inspiring. I always thought of George Stoney as first a teacher, as a documentary filmmaker, but also as a social activist who was concerned not just making documentary films to entertain, but documentary films that were going to make a difference. What can my films do? And that's something he says in his uh, documentary traditions class a lot. Uh, the film doesn't end with the screening. There's a discussion after a screening. I mean, you'll see it again, time and time again with George's films, inside of George's films. In 1976, Stoney traveled to Ireland, where he created another classic. How the Myth Was Made used Robert Flaherty's film, Man of Aaron, to explore ethical questions all filmmakers must grapple with. In How the Myth Was Made, he actually has one of those screening scenarios. He shows the original Man of Aaron to people and then has this great discussion about it. The Islanders have been arguing about Flaherty's film ever since he left. Some are proud of the hard struggle he dramatized. Others resent being associated with such poverty. Could you tell me what people on the island think of the film? There were lots of things that never happened really here at all. But in other words, it didn't represent the life of the people at all here, do you see? There's always a dialogue with George. And that dialogue is what changes the world. And that's what I've learned from George. What you bring into the classroom is the most important thing in the classroom. In a teaching career that has spanned over four decades, George Stoney has taught thousands of students and earned a reputation as the nation's preeminent film educator. As a mentor, he is unparalleled. I mean, he, he gives of himself and really cares about what his students are doing and and brings energy and enthusiasm to their projects and i get a call on the phone with him and he's saying i just discovered paulo freire i'm reading his text again and discovering what to do with my students you know i can't wait to to try this out this man is 95 been teaching for 40 years and he's still learning and still excited about learning how to teach <laughs> His staunch advocacy of community-based media has made him universally recognized as the grandfather of public access television. He is a stand-up filmmaker for the voice of the people. That's a very, very empowering uh, act that George helped uh, create. I'm always very proud to say that George Stoney is 95, that he's still out there. When someone asks, when are you going to retire? My retort is always, I'm going to stay as long as George Stoney stays. Certainly the world is a better place because of George Stoney. Uh, NYU is a better place because of George Stoney. Thousands of students are better people because of George Stoney. I think there are some inconvenient histories that sort of mainstream America might want to forget because they make us uncomfortable. And I think George's efforts to represent that part of American history is what keeps I think his democratic ideals alive about making sure that we all understand where we come from.
I'm Kathy Bisbee. I'm the from CMAP TV in Gilroy, California. And I'm also the fundraising co-chair along with Mike Wassenaar for ACM National. And while I am a little young to have gotten the opportunity to benefit directly from George's tut tutelage, his presence was very apparent to me when I walked into these rooms five years ago. The sense of community that we have with each other in community media, I think was best for me today summarized in the quote that Gordon Quinn shared, the John Dewey quote, that community is a place where people come together. And our media centers are that physical location in our communities where community can grow and can flourish. And as George, one of George's uh, big inspirations to me was around creating a dialogue as a filmmaker and as a community media person, how we create a dialogue and we create a sense of community at our physical locations and now also online. And that sense of community was hugely important to George as he and others founded the Alliance for Community Media many, many years ago. And we continue to carry on that legacy of community and building collaboration, which is the theme of this conference. We couldn't have gotten here without the work and inspiration of George Stoney in the Alliance for Community Media. And in that spirit, I'd like to bring a few folks up who would like to make a donation to our national movement that George inspired. Could Nancy Richards please come down to the podium? Thank you. And also, uh, could all of the representatives from the Northeast region come? Thank you so much. So uh, one of the things that the Northeast region was inspired to do, as well as Deb Rogers, who is uh, Falmouth Community Television, is to make a donation in memory of George Stoney. And if that's something that you would like to do today as well, we do have donation forms that are, we are passing around. But I want them to just say for a moment why they decided to make this contribution and for how much to the Alliance in memory of George. The Northeast Region is pleased and proud to pledge to the Alliance for Community Media for Public Policy in memory of George Stoney, $7,500 for this year. I have the deer in the headlights look, I know. <laughs> um, our board meets every March um, to do long-range planning and um, it's a time when we all get to network together, talk about what our future is, what our goals are, and also what our purpose is as part of the Alliance. And our purpose, one of our major purposes as a region to the Alliance is to promote um, the, the goals and the missions of the national organization and our state chapters. And so in keeping with that, our donation to the public policy fund in, in memory of George Stoney is appropriate because we feel that um, as an organization, we can't stand divided. We must stand together. Thank you. Deb Rogers, the national board chair. Thank her for her contribution. and. Thanks. I'm actually standing here now as the executive director and CEO of Falmouth Community Television, Falmouth, Massachusetts. You know, we come together, we learn about franchises, we learn about fair use, we learn about um, all the different things that we need to know to run, you know, working with boards of directors and whatnot. But the one thing that George always said to me was, it's about the storytelling. And so on behalf of my organization, we want to honor George's work. We want to honor the work that you all do in telling the stories in your communities. And on behalf of Falmouth Community Television, we have made a donation of $2,500 in George's name. Thank you both to the Northeast Region and to Deb Rogers and Falmouth TV. So if that's something that you would like to do, um, please write your name on the, please write George's name on the pledge form so that we know that that's something that you are doing. Um, please, if you'd like to make the, your gift tax deductible, please write the Foundation for Community Media, for the Alliance for Community Media. I think we mentioned that last night, but some of you may not have heard. And we'll have national board members uh, waiting outside the doors if you'd like to hand in your forms and checks and any, anything else you'd like to do today. So um, I want to thank them again. Thank you. Big round of applause for the Northeast. Thank you.
Deb Rogers. And I also want to say that um, last evening at the opening reception, we, um, you, raised $3,000 for the Alliance for Community Media. So thank you to all of you who contributed. And have a great conference. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.